have given a name to my pain. Hey now, welcome to the second half of the Batman on Film podcast, episode number 148, with the great Michael Uslan. I am Bill Jett Ramey, the founder and the editor-in-chief of Batman on Film. Michael comes back to the podcast and discusses all the great events that happened out at San Diego Comic-Con in regards to Batman's 80th anniversary, plus his panel for the 30th anniversary of Batman 1989. Thanks for listening. Batman on Film, authoritative definitive, the Dad Gum Original. Hey, Mr. Uslan, how you doing? I'm doing great, Bill. How's life treating you? Oh, it's, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good. So, uh, steaming hot. You know what? Uh, we had a cold front, and we have a we had we had a record low this morning. It was it was sixty two degrees, which is oh my god, yes, which is usually it's like seventy seven, you know, mid seventies and 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 uh, you know nineties. So uh, and it's only like eighty two right now. Unbelievable. I, I, I have never. I've lived here my whole life. I've never. I don't think I've experienced that in in late July ever. So. <laughs> You are lucky because while well, I've been in California, I hear back in New Jersey, it's been like a heat index of 150 I degrees. saw that on the news that they had a yeah bad heat on the East Coast. Wow, wow. Yeah. All right. Let's let's get into it. You're back. You're back from Comic Con. Yeah. And was it? You know, I followed it from. You know, I followed it on the internet because I wasn't out there this year. But it seemed like there was a lot of. Uh, Batman celebration going on was is that is that a uh, a fair um, analysis of what of what I saw being reported from San Diego? That's an understatement. Okay, okay. Uh, it, it, it was actually quite a magical convention, and it's interesting, Bill. Um, it it had a different feel to it because most of the studios did not show up at Hall H for the mm-hmm. grand presentations. Um, it's like everything ultimately seeks its own level. And it just felt to me and, and my friends that it was generally more comic book centric this year yeah. than it has been in a long time. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that was true in, in terms of panels as well as in presentation and in booths on the floor. It was very heartening to see that kind of reaction in terms of Batman. It was like, oh, my God, um, let's start with uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. The awesome, awesome pop-up opening of the Comic-Con Museum, which is this massive building in Balboa Park. Mm-hmm. It is going to be a permanent museum. This was just a pop-up opening during Comic-Con. Its official opening is still not until 2021. And if I told you in the last 10 weeks, and I've been, my son David and I have been consulting actively with them now, it went from like this cavernous, empty space into three levels of the Batcave. Wow. And it was magnificent. Um, I understand over the uh, few days of Comic-Con, they had nearly 25,000 visitors come through. Mm. And for those of us that were there, it wasn't simply about the fact there were two Batmobiles there. There were the, all the costumes from all the different pictures mm-hmm. and the props and blow-ups of key covers and artwork. Um, there, there was just so much there in creating the Batcave feel. But it was about the creation and the inauguration of the first comic book hall of fame and i feel a 
personal validation here for a, a lifetime of work insofar as what we've been able to accomplish since and as a result of 1989 and the fact that the very first comic book character inducted into the Hall of Fame was Batman, not yes. Superman. Yeah. And that, that, that's a miracle. If you told me that when I was a kid, I would say absolutely, positively impossible. The guy's going to be second. Superman's got to be first. So um, to all of us who are Batman fans, what an incredible triumph. Was And Batman was the only comic book character that went in, correct? That's correct. Yes. And I have to give a shout out uh, to my pals at DC Comics. Uh, DC and Warner were right there supportive of the museum and of this opening. And I have to tell you that Dan DiDio gave one of the greatest talks um, that I heard that night at the ceremony where he turned away from the teleprompters and gave a speech from his heart mm. that was absolutely magnificent and emotional. Um, Jim Lee added to that as well. Um, it was, it was, it was a great night and there was a lot of camaraderie and a lot of people who shared a mutual passion there. Uh, I saw the pictures, I read the stories and it looked, it looked awesome. I saw you with the Batmobiles and of course you've, you've been in, you sat in most of them, not all of them, I'm sure. So, but it's still, it's always a, it's always a kick. It's always great to see that stuff. No matter, no matter how many times you've seen it, it's still, you know, see the Batmobile, you know, see the costumes and stuff like that. So it's fantastic, Batman being in this museum. And uh, who would... Um, oh, I have to yeah, add... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, the, the kind folks from Warner Brothers and AT&T asked me if I would please consider coming over so they could get pictures of me sitting in the driver's seat mm. of the Batmobiles. Um, and I said, oh, no, I don't do that. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, um, I went over and I said, here's a warning. As I get into the driver's seat of these Batmobiles, uh, the Michael Euston you've been dealing with is going to vanish. And I said, I am absolutely positively letting 12-year-old Michael out. And uh, and they did. And I, I swear to God, Bill, I was 12 years old again. Awesome. You know, this... This may be an off the wall question, not really. It's Batman related, but if you could only, but it speaks to the history and the different mediums you find Batman. If you could only have one piece of Batman, quote unquote, art, whether whether it be a comic book cover or a splash page or a panel from a comic or a or a you know a, a movie one sheet poster. Anything. What what would the one thing you would have to have no matter what and you could let everything else go, but you you would want to keep that? Well, if we let's eliminate first off okay. the stuff like the like oh having the original art to the cover of Detective Twenty Seven or Batman mm -hmm. number one. So let let's eliminate that. I would say that there's a couple of pages. One would be the origin page from Detective Twenty from uh, Detective Thirty Three. Mm -hmm. One would be the cover of Batman Forty Seven, which was the anniversary issue, the origin story. Mm -hmm. And the third one would be the last page of Detective Comics Four Thirty Nine, my favorite Batman story of all time, that shows Bruce Wayne in his Batman costume with his cowl off, crying, breaking down. Yeah. Breaking down into tears in front of the portrait of his parents. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, all right. So you talked about that Batman 89 oh, that was, panel. That was Go ahead. When, that was just Wednesday night, Bill. Yes. I, absolutely. <laughs> so you held the Batman 89 panel. Let's talk. I mean, tell me, tell us all about it. Everybody wants to know. You, you, you said you would come back on and tell us about about the Batman stuff at Comic Con, and we're doing it. So, Batman eighty nine. It had to been a, a good time at the panel. Well, all right. So, as we get there um, Thursday night, just okay. so you know, yes, um, our company Strawberry Pictures, in association with TCL, which uh, owns Grauman's Chinese Theater, mm -hmm. and the movie theater and great restaurant, the Sugar Factory in downtown San Diego, Gaslamp District, and with Legion M and the Stan Leaf Foundation 
and uh, a couple of other companies threw the party of the decade at Comic-Con on the rooftop of the brand new, uh, we, we opened it up, the brand new um, bar and um, great, great venue overlooking the city uh, on top of that theater. And we had about 350 people who, I think everybody there was somebody you would either know or recognize. And it, it was a phenomenal night of all comic book fans and pros. And I loved the fact that that was, uh, that was that kind of combination. And again, Batman was the hot topic of conversation. On Friday at noon, I did Danny Fingeroff's panel with Paul Levitz and Todd McFarland, Maggie Thompson. Um, we, we, and we did a panel remembering Stan Lee and mm. it's, it should have been in a room at least twice as big because I understand they had to turn away as many oh, wow. people as they let me. But that was magical, fun, celebratory. And actually at the end, we act, we did have a cameo from Stan. So that, that was very special. Wow. Um, but the big event for me, um, post the Comic-Con Museum opening, was Saturday evening, the 30th anniversary celebration of Batman 1989. Now, in connection with that, the Comic-Con Museum had a surprise showing of the movie on the big screen in their fabulous, fabulous theater. And... Um, I got there an hour ahead of time because I had to give the, the tech guys uh, the two trailers I wanted to run that night. And as I walked in, I saw, oh, my God, something's gone wrong. They booked me into that gigantic hall that is, you know, just under Hall H. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, oh, this is this this is gonna, this is cavernous. Like, what's going to happen if we only get like 500 people showing up? Um, but to, to my great pleasure and astonishment, um, by the time things got underway, we had a jam packed house SRO. Uh, they tell me we, um, we had 2,500 people there and, um, it was, it was pure magic. It was pure magic because they've heard a lot of, of various people from the different studios get up in hall H and other places and, you know, Comic book geeks like me, mm -hmm. comic comic con fanboys, they can snip out a corporate suit in a second. Mm. And the fact that they got to know me one on one kind of that evening and realize and understand that I was one of them. I am one of them. Mm -hmm. And I said, We are here because we're a community and that's what comic cons are about. It's a community. It is an extended family of people that share this incredible joint passion that often have been ostracized from other um, circles and other social circles, um, but find comfort and support and friendship in the confines of a Comic-Con experience. And that we're all in this together. I then introduced from the audience two people who represent to me um, two people who, for whom there would be no DC Comics Batman. Um, and that was Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, the founder of DC Comics. I introduced his daughter, Nikki Wheeler Nicholson, who just came out with this great book from Hermes Press, DC Comics Before Superman. And it was the major who started DC, gave birth to New Fun, which became More Fun Comics, New Comics, which became Adventure Comics, Detective Comics, and had planned to, uh, and was there until moments before the launch of Action Comics number one, when he was ousted from the, his own company, hmm. and it was uh, taken over quite unfairly. Um, and Nikki received a, an incredible ovation from the crowd. And then I introduced my second guest. Um, and I said she is an incredibly talented artist. Her paintings that she's doing of Batman and recreations of Batman covers are amazing. And she also happens to be 
the granddaughter of Bill Finger, Mm -hmm. and I introduced Athena Finger and made sure the crowd understood Bill's contribution to the creation of Batman. So that's how we got underway. And I have to say, in one something I will never forget, my son David, um, whom I raised the right way as a total fanboy geek, um, and is now my partner in my producing, uh, David introduced me, and um, that was really amazing to have happen. Um, awesome. From, from there, I gave the talk and, and talked about why I was such a Batman fan, what it was like growing up when I did uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, teaching the first, the world's first ever college accredited course on comic books, going to work for DC Comics, getting the right Batman, getting to buy the rights to Batman when I was still a kid in my 20s, uh, talk about the genius and the making of uh, the genius of Tim Burton and Anton First and Danny Elfman, the making of the 1989 Batman movie, the fact that it is not, in retrospect, historically, about its tremendous box office success and all the records it broke. It is about its impact on the world culture and the world's perception of comic books and superheroes. It changed the world. It changed Hollywood. Yes. Uh, talked about the genius of Christopher Nolan. Uh, we did Q&A, and the Q&A was a lot of fun. And then, of course, as part of them understanding how fans react so horribly to different announcements about casting in particular, <laughs> and how yeah. they were ready to um, really string us up, I think, because of the announcement of Michael Keaton playing Batman mm-hmm. in a movie directed by the director of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. So we were accused of making another campy, funny comedy version of Batman. Can you imagine if that had happened today, in today's world with social media, the whole Keaton? I mean, the Keaton thing was a big deal even 30 years ago. I just can't even imagine it today. It would just been unbelievable, you know? It it would have to be a, you know, it, it, it was the biggest thing ever. Yeah. And that was through mainstream media. Yes. I can't even yeah. picture, I can't even begin to picture what it would be like times a hundred in today's world. Yeah. I, I, I just don't know what that would be like. But um, that was... That was incredible. So we talked about the casting of Keaton and the fans' reaction and how the most important thing was to get the first trailer out Mm -hmm. that would change fandoms and the world's perception of what we were doing and what was coming. And I showed the original trailer, Mm -hmm. and most of the people jammed into that big room had never seen it before. never seen it. Wow, yeah. And it it was... I think really shocking to them, really surprising, um, and it brought back the impact of that picture to uh, to the people who were old enough to remember yeah. it. You making me feel? You making me feel old because I was one, like I told you last time. I was one of the ones that went and paid to to get into a movie that I didn't want to see just to see the trailer. So yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. We talked about that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then we talked about how history has repeated itself. When Chris Nolan announced the casting, Heath Ledger as the mm-hmm. Joker, and Anne Hathaway as Catwoman, and then later Ben Affleck as Batman, mm-hmm. and then Robert Pattinson as uh, Bruce Wayne, and and how this happens over and over again, and the importance of believing in and allowing a filmmaker who really does have a knowledge and a passion for a character, um, give them the chance and and. Wait until you see it mm-hmm. before you judge it. And then, as I say, once you see it, judge the hell out of it. But yeah. up until that point, everybody's got to you know, give the filmmaker a break. Yes. Well, you know how it goes. It goes from, oh, my God, this is the worst uh, casting of all time. I'm not going to see the movie to, they, you know, you see a... Uh, maybe a, a first publicity still where well oh okay that look doesn't look too bad and then you see a trailer and it's like oh this looks really good and then by the time the movie comes out it's it's the greatest Joker slash Batman slash Catwoman we, I've ever seen in my life no one else could play it so it, that we'll we'll have the same thing with with Robert Pattinson I'm sure yeah so you know that that's kind of the way it goes but the fans got it yeah and there good was, there were so there were so many laughs yeah. in that hour 
and so many, so much applause in that hour, and so much, I think, bonding um, that was going on. And the Q and A was fabulous. And um, then I said, "Listen, I didn't do this. I found this on the internet, and I don't even know who did it. But man, you guys know I'm involved in Turner Classic Movies, mm-hmm. and I showed that trailer that someone put together." What if the Batman 89 movie had yes. been made in 1939? Yeah, I put it on the side. It's awesome, yeah. It is awesome. The yeah. crowd went crazy over that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the bottom line was we all had so much fun, and it took – I could not get out of the room for almost two hours uh, from people that were coming up to me. And it, it's not just about the picture taken and the autographs. Mm-hmm. It's about, um, Bill, if I told you how many of them – with tears in their eyes, mm-hmm. said, I need to thank you for the 89 Batman and what it did to me or to my life. And and the, the most incredible thing was one after another, I saw it with my dad, I saw it with my mom, I saw it with my grandpa, I mm-hmm. saw it with my family, and, and my mom's not here anymore, my dad's not here anymore, my grandparents are gone. And, and I had this bonding experience that is emblazoned in my heart that I will never forget. It, it's so important to me. And yeah, so I start tearing up. And, um, and this isn't just here and there. This is consistent. And, and maybe that, Bill, is the greatest legacy for me yes. of that film. Well, Michael, you're, you're, you're beloved. I know just the fact that you, you come on, um, the little Facebook fan group for, for, for Batman on film, they, they, people, the, the, the people there, the members can't believe it. And I'm saying, well, Michael's, he's one of us. He's, and, and they, they feel, they view you as like the protector of Batman on film. I mean, I, I do. And I, you know, it, it's been the fact that I've been able to call you a friend and have lunch with you and have you come on this podcast and do articles for Batman on film. Uh, you're you're one of my Batman heroes, and it's 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 been one of my one of the one of the mo- most satisfying things that that's come out of me doing this site for, for 21 years now. So, for on behalf of all those people, I want to thank you. So, yes, I want you to know you are beloved, Bill. I, I so appreciate that. You know, I've told you this story probably 20 times over about that conversation Ben had with me. Mm-hmm. Um, when we got our final rejection from the yes. studios, yes, and you know that that's the kind of stuff that um, I carry forward, and um, and I would be very remiss, Bill, if I didn't do and follow what my mentor and friend Stan Lee told me, and that is, Michael, whenever you have an opportunity, get in the damn plug. <laughs> so I want to just mention. That the boy who loved Batman, my autobiography, mm-hmm. my memoir, uh, will be out in October in a brand new hardback edition. Okay, uh, awesome. And also a leather bound edition. And I couldn't be more excited about it. It's going to have a new prologue and a very large super epilogue attached to it that will bring my story up to date. Well, you know and, what? And that's crazy because I was one of my questions I had written down I was going to ask you is you've, have you thought about. Uh, adding to the boy who loved Batman. So there you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, and I'll go beyond it, Bill. And this has not been announced yet. There has not yet been a press release, and there won't be for a while. But just between us Batman fans, <clears throat> I've already signed the contract to do the sequel book. Oh, fantastic. So I'm very, very happy about that as well. Yes. That sound that is great. That makes me happy. It makes a lot of people listening happy. So, man, it must have just. It, it was a blast, wasn't it? It was just awesome. It sound, It sounds great. Great time out there, and the fact that eighty nine and all the you know the the the, the brotherhood of, of being Batman fans and comic book fans and Batman being celebrated. It was just it. This was a, this was a, a special a special Comic Con for you. I, I, I'm assuming. It was, it was magical. And I have to mention one other thing. I took time out and said to everybody, now listen, you all love the movies. You love to talk about the movies. You love to write about the movies. But let's pause for a moment to honor two groups of people who unfairly do not get the spotlight enough. 
I said, one are all the brilliant people over the decades who have worked on the animation. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm telling you right now, some of the best stories ever in the media have come out of the animation. Mm -hmm. And those people must be recognized for what they've contributed. Um, and, and, and then I mentioned my Mark Hamill has got to be on the Mount Rushmore of Jokers. And oh, for the sure. importance yeah. of, of Kevin Conroy, Andrea Romano, Bruce Tim, Paul Dini, all those folks. And then I said, and the other ones who really no longer get the spotlight they deserve are the people at DC Comics who every week since 1939 have had to bring us back into the stores to find out what's happening next to Batman, who the next villain's going to be. I said, those publishers, editors, writers, artists, inkers, colorists, letterers, they've got to get the spotlight. You've got to give them the appreciation, the respect, and the accolades that they deserve because without them being there every week for 80 years, which is an astonishing accomplishment, there would be none of this. Yes. And, and let's get the accent back on that. So that was an important thing to, to discuss as well. Yes. Fan great. All right. It sounds, I, I, I wish I could have been, I wanted, I almost went out there just for the, just for the museum uh, induction just on that Wednesday because I thought it would be great. And, and, and like you said, you said it was magical. I appreciate you coming on and telling us about that. Let's kind of relive it or, you know, giving us a vision, those of us who missed it. And, uh, I mean, we got a lot to look forward to Batman wise with, with the Batman ramping up and we've got the Joker coming and we've got birds of prey, you know, birds of prey, which basically is it, you know, it's in the Batman world for sure. So, um, one question. Oh, almost, yeah, go ahead. I go, go. That. Yes. Um, uh, Gary Mariano and the uh, the Warner team, the the animation team, uh, premiered Batman Hush, the new animated yes. movie there. As yes. Well. So I, I certainly didn't want to slight that as one of the Batman events that took place. Those um, those animated movies are are really fantastic. The Batman, I mean, all of them really are. But you know, my focus on the Batman ones. I, I love I love those things. You know, hope they keep them coming. I love. I mean. All of them. I loved, you know, Batman Brave and the Bold and Scooby Doo. I mean, there's, I mean, it doesn't matter. Give me, you know, the one that came out recently with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, there's, there's Batman, Batman for everybody. There's something for everyone. There's definitely. There is. And speaking, speaking of that, and I hate to run long with you, but you know me once you get me started yes. talking about Batman. Um, one of the things I said to everybody, and I cautioned them, I said, now don't go online. And send the Batman producer said this. I said, because let's make it perfectly clear. Right now, I am only talking as another geek. Mm -hmm. I am not talking as the yeah. producer. The producer hat is off. So don't get online and confuse the issue because I want everybody to be clear about it. <laughs> yeah. I said, as a fanboy geek, like 15 years ago or more, um, I, I pushed and pushed and pushed to do a Batman Beyond live action movie. Yes. And we actually had a great script from Paul Dini. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and I, I saw it as a Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah. Where, you know, Clint Eastwood yes. playing Bruce Wayne in his 70s. Yes. And unfortunately, you know, as things in Hollywood tend to go, it didn't happen. I said, but as a fanboy geek right at this moment, how great would it be to try to entice Tim Burton back to complete a trilogy mm -hmm. with Michael Keaton starring in Batman Beyond? You know, with, with films like with DC and or Warner Brothers doing things like Joker that are just the standalone, is there is it is it the time for we, where you can do something like that? Even though you may have a um, you know a running Batman uh, series on film with uh, with Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson right now. Could you do a, a one-off Batman Begins, or I'm sorry, Batman uh, Beyond with, like you said, with Tim Burton and, and Keaton, and they, they coexist at relatively the same time? So let me answer that without answering it. Okay. Okay. Um, the world has changed so much since 1989. It has changed so much since The Dark Knight came out. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is sophisticated enough and is interested in soaking up the intimate details of things they 
maybe never heard of before, such as Guardians of the Galaxy, mm-hmm. or some of the cosmic characters that inhabit the world of Avengers Endgame and Infinity War. And, um, and I think they, their interests spread far and wide, and I think Marvel's going to prove that as they move into the next phase of all the Marvel movies that are going to break from what came before. I think a lot of people were either astonished, shook up, or whatever when it was announced that Natalie Portman is the new Thor. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but I think we're living in a time when people are open to accepting changes in canon, different interpretations, following different filmmakers the way they're going, and I, I just think it's a different world. So my answer is neither yes nor no. Yeah. It is just a general statement about the uh, the global market. Oh, I agree. I agree. And, and kind of, well, let me ask you one more thing because it kind of, kind of spins off of that. Um, we've had you've had Gotham. We've we've we're getting Batwoman uh, this fall on the CW. We've got Pennyworth coming. Um, on epics i believe is the the channel anyway is there is it is it in warner and warner dc warner brothers tv that they're very protective of batman because of the film franchise is can a batman tv series with i mean with batman coexist along the same at the same time as the film series Uh, um, the studio certainly believes that it's true and Mm -hmm. they're following that path understood absolutely all right michael mr uselin i'm gonna let you go i appreciate you coming on and telling us all about comic-con and all the other tangents we went on um you're welcome anytime anytime to come here and talk to us anytime Bill, Bill, some, something important just happened. Okay. I finally got you to call me Michael instead of Mr. Uslan. I, I heard it. Yes, I, that's, it's, that was hard. I that's tough it. for me to do, sir. That is. I know. Yes. But you're making improvements. I am. I'm it. trying. I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to get better. <laughs> All right. Any, any last words before I let you run? Uh, yeah. It's great. It's great to be alive in these times if you're a comic book fan. And soak it up, enjoy it, make the most of it. But remember, at the end of the day, we are a community. We are an extended family. Um, I grew up in a different generation where I collected and read and loved everything. When I was growing up, there was nobody who said, I love Marvel, I hate DC, or I love DC, I hate Marvel. We, we embraced everything. Mm-hmm. Every time a Marvel movie succeeds, it's good for us. Every time one of uh, the Batman movies succeeds, it's good for Marvel. And on that level, we truly are um, a community of pros who respect each other's work and, uh, and in many cases have uh, great friendships among all of us. And I would hope that the fans you know, open their hearts and open their minds and open their arms to, uh, to embracing everything because it's all good for us in the hobby, the passion that we all share. Fantastic. I have nothing to say. I'm going to let that be the end of it. All right. You have a good one. And uh, when you, what's up for you next? You're going back to China? What, what's, where are you traveling to? Oh, man. You know, at this point in time, the airline is naming me man of the year, I think. Uh, <laughs> somebody said to me recently, I got to get a package to you. Where do I mail it? mail it. I said, send it to American Airlines C3B. It'll get to me. So that's kind of my life. Uh, understood. Understood. All right. You have a good one, sir. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Take care. Hey now, you have been listening to the official podcast of the one and only Batman on Film website. On Twitter, follow BOF at Batman on Film and the Batman Podcast Network at BatPod Network. For Jet and everyone at Batman on Film, I'm announcer Rachel. Thanks for listening to the authoritative, definitive, the original Batman on Film.